When I saw that video this morning that began our service, my mind went back 50 years ago to Fort Worth, Texas, where I was a youth pastor. And uh, we'd gone through Passion Week, Holy Week, you know, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter sunrise service, and Easter. And as I was sitting in the church worshiping that morning, I had one of those aha moments, much like we saw in the video, when it finally dawned on me that we were celebrating an historical fact, the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that made a profound difference in my life. My life was different from there on because of the reality of that. Now we know that even from the very beginning, there were doubters and scoffers who ridiculed the fact that Jesus was literally bodily risen from the grave. Remember the religious leaders and the political leaders and how they were putting their spins on their spins to protect themselves, uh, saying, well, he didn't really die on the cross. He just kind of passed out. And when he was in that cool, cool tomb, he came back to life and he either he took off running and hid or his disciples stole him away or he's dead and they buried him someplace but he couldn't be risen from the dead fast forward to the 20th century in the first church I was pastoring we had a young man who had grown up in a mainline liberal denomination and went away to college and he encountered this group I don't know if you've ever heard of them Campus Crusade for Christ <laughs> and uh, he became a follower of Jesus was profoundly converted and understood what it, mean, what it meant to know Jesus as Savior. He returned home to be in his family business and he was in his home church and on Easter Sunday he heard something that was a bit different. That Jesus really didn't come out of the grave. Uh, it was just a myth. It's a fable. We call that demythologizing scripture today. But now nah, it was just a fairy tale. I mean he didn't really do that. I mean it's a good idea and it can help you handle life but to say he was literally risen from the dead. Well that young man took a survey of all the pastors in his denomination in that, in that state and there was a lot of them, hundreds of them and uh, overwhelmingly came back that they did not believe in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now as a pastor I say why in the world are you preaching? I mean go, go back pyramiding peas or whatever it is but to say to not proclaim that but so he he joined our church then this past week did you hear in the news uh, there's a, a movie out about the life of Jesus and some liberal theologians were saying well that's that was a myth it wasn't real his resurrection from the dead it's always been with us but if you t look at the text the biblical text underscores the importance that the resurrection was an historical fact the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. For you see, Christianity is based upon facts, historical facts. And not only back to the resurrection of Jesus, but if you take it way back to the roots of faith, to Father Abraham, and then through the, the, nation, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, it's based on facts. It's not based on myth or fantasy. I mean, I've read religions of the world that are based on myth and fairy tales and gods and goddesses. Christianity is not. It's based on facts. That's why when you read in the Old Testament that one book that many people read and, and it's the, I, get, I get a request for one particular chapter out of that book at every funeral I performed. That's of course Psalm 23 but the book of Psalms I call that soul music because when I'm discouraged I go to the Psalms. When I'm excited I go to the Psalms. When I'm disappointed I go to the Psalms. It speaks to our soul. And you'll read through the Psalms that the, the writer will say, now you remember, remember God created this thing. You remember God took us out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery and Remember, God took us into the promised land. It's based on historical facts. And the most important fact in all of history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today. That's why many people come together. 
something important about Easter. It's the time when we celebrate the reality of the risen Christ. And the Holy Spirit, of course, anticipated that and used the Apostle Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 15, but indeed Christ has been raised from the dead. When the NIV translates that indeed, it's underscoring how important this fact is. This keystone of faith. Why we're here. Why we celebrate Easter. It's not just for the fancy clothes. It's not just for the Easter egg hunts. It's not just for the candy. Although I'm not sure about that. I kind of like my chocolates. But it's not for any of that, although there's nothing wrong with that. But it's for the fact that Jesus is risen, as we have over here. He is risen, and in indeed, amen. That's important. You see, it's no myth that Jesus came out of the grave, literally. It's a fact, and because of that, it should make a difference in your life. It made a difference in mine. After service, somebody came up to me and said when they were a teenager, how they went to a camp up in the state of Washington and how when they walked away they realized if Jesus is risen then I've got to be different and that's true and so this morning I just want to share some things about the resurrection because we're living in a day when all kinds of religions are saying reincarnation atheists are saying although from as a philosopher I studied philosophy in the University of Texas at Arlington that there's no pure atheist but let's give them that atheist that are saying there's nothing there's no God it's more than that we need to be reminded again and again especially on Easter Sunday that first of all in 1st Corinthians 15 Paul wrote verse 1 I want to remind you of the gospel I preached he's reminding them what he had preached to them for what I received I pass on to you as of first importance this is primary that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he said he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then to over five hundred at once. You see, how could you have a myth appear to five hundred people at once? You can't. That'd be, you can't get that many people to have the same illusion or, or, or experience. The resurrection's real. And Paul says, the thing we preached, this was of first importance, this was primary, this was our message, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It wasn't social justice, although we as Christians ought to encourage our, where we can our governments to be just, but it's not social justice, it's not a good person, good moral standing, or have, be a political entity and involvement, it's Christ crucified, buried, risen according to the scriptures. It's an historical fact. That was the message. That's what drove the early apostles. And they to the last one died for the faith. It drove the early church. That was the message the early church gave. Christ crucified, buried, risen according to the scriptures. That was the message. Nothing else. That's why within 300 years in that pagan world they turned the world upside down or as one theologian said they turned the world right side up because of the message that they had proclaimed. They didn't compromise the message in any way. They continued to hammer away Christ is risen from the dead. That was the message of the church. Then the second reason he says in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15 if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, if this is not an historical fact, that Christ rose bodily from the grave, then it's an empty faith. It's useless. I mean, why do we come together? We had to go out and go on the golf course, or go to the car track, or go whatever you do on, for recreation, because this is useless. And our preaching is useless and in vain. And imagine Paul. We have recorded the hardships he endured. We have 
from apocryphal writings and, and, and traditions how all the other apostles died, but we have a pretty accurate description of Paul, what he experienced. He was shipwrecked several times. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He lost his, his family because of the faith. I mean, this guy endured a lot of hardships, and then he died a martyr. Tradition says on the same day Peter was crucified, he was. So these, these guys died for the faith. But he's saying, if there is no resurrection, our preaching is useless. It has no power. A third point that he makes in verse 15. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the, deed, the dead are not raised. Now, wait a minute, Paul. It's okay if you have a lot of moxie to say your preaching is useless. Uh, even though this, he probably was converted somewhere around his mid-30s. And then he wrote Corinthians, and you know there were at least four letters to the Corinthians, but this one he probably wrote somewhere in the mid-50s. So he's about 50 in his mid-50s, and he's thinking, maybe if there is no resurrection, my preaching is useless. Now that's quite a thing to swallow, isn't it? But wait a minute, Paul. You've got a lot of moxie to say that about your preaching, but now he's talking about mine. He says, I'm a liar. My preaching, I'm a false witness. I'm distorting the truth. Now, I know, I'm not speaking just for myself. I know a lot of godly men and women who are pastors around the world who are sincere people who want people to know the truth. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying to me as a pastor to see people who are freed because of the truth when they finally come to Christ. Just as Maddie's testimony as a college student was struggling with her sin and she felt in chains and when she finally understood who Christ was and the message of the gospel she felt free. It reminded me of, of John Bunyan's great work Pilgrim's Progress. I hope you read that sometime in your spiritual journey but he talks about Christian walking along and he was overwhelmed with the weight of his sin and then he saw the empty tomb and his sin rolled off his back down the hill into that empty tomb because of that empty tomb. And I love to see that. But Paul, you're saying, if there's no resurrection, all of your preachers, from then, from then until now, are liars. Okay, but wait a minute. He's also talking about somebody else. He's talking about Jesus. <laughs> saying Jesus is a liar if there's no resurrection. Because it was Jesus who said, if you destroy this body, in three days it'll come out of the grave. He prophesied that. He said that would happen. And if he did not, then he is a liar. And so everything else he said, all the, the marvelous teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, all that teaching about people who are caught in sin, the woman taken in adultery, and how he gloriously helped her deal with the past, that they're no longer healed, and he's lying about, the, remember, he said just before he died, he said, now, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come back and take you to be with me. He's a liar if there is no resurrection of the dead. You see, this is what Paul is saying. And he's facing it head on. Dare any false teacher of any false religion say that? No, they want to say, hey, <laughs> keep those cards and letters coming and especially have checks in the mail when you send it. But they won't tell you the truth, as Paul is telling us the truth, if there is no resurrection. You see, if there is a resurrection, it does make a difference. It makes a difference in those who proclaim the message of the gospel. And then his fourth point on thinking about the resurrection is found in verse 17. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Now, if there's no resurrection, our faith is futile. Why are we here today if there is no resurrection? I mean, let's go have a good time. 
I've heard people say, oh, even if there were no resurrection, I'd still be a Christian. Not me. I wouldn't. I know the price I've had to pay in dealing with my sins, dealing with my self-centeredness, dealing with struggling of loving my wife as I love myself, dealing with being the parent I should be. I know the price that I have to pay. I wouldn't be here if there's no resurrection. Because all of our hopes are useless. And there are times, aren't there, and I'm sure everyone in this audience has had a time when you just felt you couldn't go anymore. You're ready. Life is hopeless. For years I had in my Bible, be kind, everyone you meet is fighting a battle. And that's true, isn't it? We're all fighting battles. And if there's no resurrection, it's futile. It's empty. It's vain. It's useless. There is no hope if there is no resurrection. But not only that, he said, you're still in your sins. Wow. Breathe a moment on that. To think of that. Maddie alluded to it, that how it helped her change and get peace and comfort. Think of it. I mean, I don't have to belabor this. I don't have to tell you your sins. You know them, don't you? I know mine. You know yours. Whether they're little, dirty little sins or dirty big sins. But our sins. Regret. One, one pastor I worked with for many years in Texas said, when you look at your life and there's a, anything in your life you wish you could do over again, that's an indicator that we're not perfect. We're sin. We're affected by sin. And how many of us? But we're still there. I mean, do you remember how when you experience God's forgiveness, I'm not talking just about salvation, but when you did something that you really messed up and to feel the relief of your guilt, just like Christian, his weight of his sins rolled into that empty tomb that you felt freed from that? My brother or sister, if Christ is not risen from the dead, you are still in your sins, as well as I am still in my sins. There is no hope if there is no resurrection. But thanks be to God, there is a resurrection. And we can rejoice in that because he is risen. But we're still there if not. Then uh, the next point he makes is found in verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. I'm sure many of us have traveled to the city of the dead. We've laid to rest a loved one. Marilyn and I have laid to rest our parents. We've had siblings, and there'll be more, either us or them or whatever. Remember, the death rate is one per person. So we're all going to die unless Jesus comes back. But for those who have fallen asleep, those that we'd love to see again, if there is no resurrection, there's no hope. We will not see them because they are lost. And I can tell you, as a pastor who've done hundreds of funerals, I know that people in, at funerals want a hope. <laughs> they want to see that loved one. But beloved, if there is no resurrection, then there is no hope. They're still lost, and we will be lost when we enter there. But then the final argument, the final encouragement Paul gives to you and me on Resurrection Sunday. It's found in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, which we began with, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits. Now you should know that being here in the citrus capital of the United States. Wherever there's a first fruit, it means that the rest will follow, right? You always have that, those early fruits <laughs> and nuts. No, did I say that? Those early fruits. But what that means is it's guaranteeing the rest. The rest of the harvest will come. So Jesus, because he was 
bodily resurrected means we will follow. And from all who have gone to be with him from the time of his life and ministry till now, till whenever, I mean, it looks like we're in the book of the Revelation, but we may not be there yet. It might be five years, might be 500 years till Jesus comes. But until that is taken care of, those are the ones who are going to come. It's a guarantee that you too will be resurrected. And hopefully, maybe uh, I can share with you more about what the Bible teaches on heaven because there's an awful lot of stuff about heaven in the Bible that we're going to enjoy when we go to be with him. But he's the first fruits. Now, the one warning out of this and why the resurrection makes a difference in your life and mine is that we need to prepare for that. Because the Bible teaches us that in, and at that time we're going to exp appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And everything you and I do will be tried. Whether it's haywood or stubble or, or gold and precious stones. Whatever it is will be revealed in that judgment seat of Christ. We need to get ready for it. The resurrection should make a difference. We need to get in preparation because it's real. Because he's the first fruits. Now you see, this is the importance of the resurrection. It does make a difference in your life and in my life. And we have to understand that and deal with that and celebrate that. So is the Easter experience, the resurrection of Christ, a reality in your life? We have to get ready for it, and the only way we get ready for it is to understand the difference between religion and a relationship. Religion will not get you there. You know, all religion can do is make you, is get you baptized, catechized, and galvanized. And I tell me, I can tell a lot of people who religious people who are galvanized and so rigid, they don't want to change. I mean, that's why there's so many fights in the church when we're trying to change and adapt to the different generations. It's too much religion. For years, I had in my notebook a cartoon that I got from Leadership Journal and had a pastor trying to change a light bulb and a dear old saint looked at him and said, Pastor, change? My mother gave that light bulb. <laughs> you know, and r religion causes you to be re uh, rigid. But it's the relationship with Jesus. Jesus said it's to be born again. So the only way you can really benefit from Easter Sunday and if this is, uh, you know, you only come to church on Easter, I would challenge you on this. It's more than coming to church on Easter. It's a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's easy as ABC. First of all, we all have to admit we're sinners. Now, that's probably the stumbling block, isn't it? I mean, I was converted uh, nine years of age at a Presbyterian summer camp in western Pennsylvania. And it wasn't too hard. I mean, I was the youngest, so I had some things about my siblings, I had to confess, <laughs> admit. <laughs> All right. Had to admit that I didn't always listen to my mom or my dad. The older we get, the harder it is, isn't it? Because we do some things that really regret. Sometimes stupid things. Sometimes because of events of life. And it's hard to admit. But you see, the Bible says we're all sinners. That in Adam, whether you believe it or not, Adam, a historical, literal person who sinned, and because of his sin, we have inherited that. But it's not just Adam's fault. I mean, the things you and I have done, right? As I've said, the, if there's anything you regret in life, that's indicative of sin. I mean, none of us is perfect. We're human. We have to acknowledge that. But we do have to admit we are sinners and we cannot save ourselves. No matter how religious we are, we cannot get to heaven. No matter how much money we give to take care of the poor, we can't buy our way to heaven. No matter how many good things we do, it's by admitting that we've sinned against God. And then believing that this thing about Easter, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, was God's way of dealing with your sin and mine. You see, that's what it's all about. 
Remember on the cross, one of the seven sayings of our Lord was, it is finished. And that word is a business term that means paid in full. Jesus paid in full for your sin and mine. Do I hear a hallelujah for that? Yay. I mean, I know what my sins have been like. I've seen sins of other people, and I, I haven't been here long enough to know your sins. Well, Jim down here in the front row, I know yours. <laughs> but we all have. But think of this, for your past sins, whether it's in drugs, alcohol, immorality, stealing, killing, whatever. Your present sins. What you did this week. <laughs> How you were kind of grousy at home. Or you didn't do what you should do, you promised to do, or whatever. And then for the future, until you, you and I go to be with God, there'll be future sins. Remember what John said? He said, if you say you have no sin, what? You deceive yourself. So, hallelujah, all of that is paid in full. All of it. And we have to believe that. And then simply see, confess. The word confess sometimes is misunderstood. We think of a confession booth or somebody was joking with me out in the gathering place uh, uh, this, before this service about their sins and they had to go confess them. But confession is not just about our sins. Confession literally means to agree with God. Agree with God. You're a sinner and you can't say yourself. Agree with God. Jesus paid it all. Agree with God that if you accept that gift of eternal life, you'll be with him. It's a relationship. That's how you make the Easter event an Easter experience for you personally. And every one of us can walk away from this worship today knowing Jesus Christ is his or her Savior. If you're here today and you haven't done that, I invite you to pray with me in a moment a prayer. A believer's prayer, a sinner's prayer, whatever you want to call it. It's not a magic bullet, but it's a way of beginning a relationship with God that will help you enjoy your Easter experience. Let's pray together. And if you're not certain about your eternal future with God and that the resurrection has made a difference for you, Pray this prayer with me, silently, sincerely in your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I confess I'm a sinner. I thank you for the gift of eternal life. Be my Savior and Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the resurrection was a bodily resurrection of Jesus. We thank you, God, that it makes a difference in so many ways, but most of all in our personal lives, from now until we step into eternity to be with you. So I pray your blessings on each of us as you do a work of grace in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.